creative, some people that can be technical, but to put those two together. For example, you have the, the stereotypical engineer mindset, the way engineers are very technically minded. Not too many, there are some, but not too many engineers are painters. You don't see, you know, you go into Accra, you don't see, you know, a big store there of, of uh, artwork created by engineers, because generally they're just not that, their mind doesn't work that way. It's, I'm not saying it's bad, it's just their mind doesn't work. Their mind is in that manner. Their mind works very much in technology. And while they will probably understand technology far better than you and I will, they, hopefully we can be more creative than they are. The other thing is you can get uh, uh, a lot of artists, say painters and the like. They have some idea of technical because you have to work the paint. You have to know how to work the paint. But if you were to give them a you know, an Excel spreadsheet or something like that, they wouldn't handle it very well because their brains aren't wired that way. They're, they're creatively minded people. So, but in communications, you have to do both because you have to be creative in how you present the message and, and how you distribute the message, and you, but you have to be technical because you have to understand the technical side of what you're doing. So if you're writing articles, you have to be technical. Your technical is the language, the grammar, the word usage, you know, you can be creative with it, of course, but it's, it's technical. There are rules of grammar you can't mistake. There are things, ways to write that people want to read it and ways to write people don't want to read it. You have to use the tool, it's a technical tool. You learned that when you were in a, a grade school or secondary school and how much you suffered over English writing classes and trying to learn the, uh, the technique the technologies of, of writing. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about, because I'm with Hope Channel, we're going to talk about photography. How many, how many uh, of you see yourselves as uh, photographers? <laughs> if, it doesn't matter how good or bad you are, you just see yourself. If I had a camera, I'd be really happy all day long taking pictures. That's the creative person. Okay, so if you know from having cameras that photography is a very technical art. You have to use the technical part and the technology to do what, what, uh, what you want it to do. You want, when you're interfacing technology, you want to be the master and you want to be in control of the technology. So when it comes to camera, you don't want the camera to rule what you do you want to rule what it does, because it's supposed to be helping or working for you. But if we don't notice this to end the photography, then it becomes the other way around, that it's, we start trying to serve its needs because we just don't really know what we're doing, okay? So we're gonna talk about photography. How many of you have a camera with you? A real camera? No. One that has like a lens, it doesn't look like a cell phone. You have one? It, it would be helpful if you, if you took it out, just to look at us what we're talking about. I'm gonna talk about some things here, then later uh, we're gonna be able to look at some things, and I'll also talk about iPhone as a, as a camera. There are advantages and disadvantages to a regular camera versus, versus an iPhone camera. How many of you know, how many of you remember from school what a photon is? You guys remember photons in school? When you take an atom and you get it all excited, Lights. it tends to shoot off photons as, as energy. Lights. And your eyeball sees that, interprets it as light. That's what light is, they're, they're photons. A camera is basically a device that records photons floating around. So your job is to use this photon recording device into something that's useful. It does nothing more or nothing less than photograph the presence of, of photons. They hit the sensor and the sensor reacts to it and you get a picture. That's all the camera is doing. Everything else you have control over. It was made to record photons. It will always record photons if you're taking pictures with it. If it's working, it will always do that. How it does it, why it does it, for what purpose, the quality of what it's doing, that's all your decision, not its decision. And 
and part of the problem with the cell phone camera is we give up too much control to the, to the phone to take the picture. I'll get into cell phones more later. There, you may have noticed already that there are many different camera styles. Each one has, has advantages and disadvantages. There are cameras like the iPhone camera. There's uh, two SLRs in here. Uh, actually, technically one SLR and one mirrorless camera. They look the same, but the uh, Nikon over here has a mirror that goes up and down. And the uh, Panasonic here, the Lumix camera that's right in front of you, does not have a mirror. Uh, but they both work in the same sense as that you look through it and you look through the, the, uh, the lens that's taking the picture. That's the preferred method to look through the lens because that's what the sensor does to take a picture as it looks through the lens. So you see exactly what the sensor sees. There's other cameras you've probably seen around range finders where you look through, the, you look through a little lens at the top and not the lens that's taking the picture. Uh, those are very uh, popular as well. But there's different types of cameras that serve different purposes. My suggestion uh, for all of you with what you're doing is to get a uh, move towards a digital SLR because it will do everything you want. It will take stills and it will take video. And most of them take stills and take video really well. Camera technology has come a long way in the last 15 years. So it will take a very nice picture. It'll do whatever you want. It's very small. Most of them are very small. The ones you, you know, you probably wouldn't buy the big ones because they start around five, six, seven thousand dollars um, $7,000. But you get a, a very good, re, uh, very good uh, result for what the camera can do, bearing in mind that the picture is not dependent upon the camera, it's dependent upon the cameraman. There's a, a um, I should have gotten pictures of this, and, and uh, if I find someone over here, I'll do that. There was, there was a guy, just, just a moment, there was a gentleman in the United States in around the 1920s or so who, named Ansel Adams. Has anybody heard of Ansel Adams? He took pictures of, uh, of Yellowstone, which is a park in the United States, very dramatic, not Yellowstone, it was Yosemite, very dramatic park in the United States. And and his pictures are very world-renowned. Let me call one up here real quick. See, even I forget technology. It's like a, I'm thinking about like fi going home and finding it on the internet and doing all this stuff, and I can just do it on the phone as we talk. This is one of his pictures. It's Yosemite. You may be familiar with that park. The picture was taken in the 1920s. There's another picture. It's called uh, El Capitan. This is a very famous picture, moon over half dome. But these are pictures of Yosemite. It's in black and white because of how old it is. He took this, these pictures with a camera. A very primitive camera. Okay, there he is with the kind of camera he used. It's a large format camera. You guys seen those before? It's like the most simple thing ever for a camera. Yeah, it's got a very primitive lens on the front. It's got this bellows and it goes back and forth so you can focus it. And it has a piece of film that goes in the back, usually a wet plate. It's actually a wet piece of glass that he puts in the back and he exposes. And sometimes the exposures may take a minute or more to do. And there he is again, he's a little older, showing that he used the camera all through his, his photography experience. To, to him, this is a portable camera, back in his older years. But that's what he used to take pictures. Now, millions of people go to that park every year. It's north of Los Angeles. 
Many people go to that park every year. Millions of people go there every year, probably just about every one of them. It has a camera, taking pictures, but nobody has taken pictures at the same place, looking at the same thing. Nobody's taken pictures as good as Ansel Adams did it. With his, with his camera that's very simple, very primitive camera. Why do you think they can't take pictures as well as Ansel Adams did, with better equipment? Yeah, he had passion and other things into it. He also um, knew, he knew the, this amazing fact that to get a good picture, yeah. And, for, and first of all, it, the picture is dependent upon the person using the camera, not on the camera. There are really, really, really good cameras out there that are owned by people that take really, really, really bad pictures. Because the make, getting a better camera doesn't mean you're going to get better pictures. Because you take the picture, the camera just follows what you want. Otherwise, you become, the, ma the master becomes the camera when you want it the other way around. And when the master becomes the camera, you take some pretty awful pictures. Because it doesn't really, you can't really read your brain. It doesn't know what you want. So he, was able to use that camera, take pictures nobody else has been able to recreate. Even standing at the same angle and everything else, I've taken, I've been there, I've taken those same pictures and I'm hugely disappointed I couldn't do better than him. He was very skilled in what he did, but it was the photographer that makes the difference with the camera. So we get that a lot in Adventist media. So someone says, oh, if I just had this camera, I could do this. Oh, if I just had that thing, I could do that. And the fact is, uh, if you're not doing it now, you probably aren't going to be able to do it with a better thing. Because actually the better thing requires more skill because it's better. So if you're not getting the pictures you want, if you're not getting the results you want, you probably don't need to look at the camera, but to look at the mirror and figure out where the difficulty is. Because a camera is just, you push a button and it takes a picture. Now you are in control. So be careful what, something I call gadgetitis. So if I just had this gadget, or just, you know what a gadget is? Gadget is any, any kind of little complicated little device. If I just had this gadget, if I just had this camera, if I just had the other thing or whatever, I could take better pictures or, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't work. It's, it's kind of a ridiculous assumption, although it makes sense when you say it, it's ridiculous. It's saying, you know, well, yesterday, yesterday I was in the airport in London making my way down here. And they had a store there, uh, Harrods, famous store in, in England. They had an outlet there at the airport, and they were selling Mont Blanc, Mont Blanc pens. Do you know what they are? Mont Blanc, M-O-N-T-B-L-A. Why am I saying it? It's a French word. I'm not the best French speaker in the room by any means. Uh, it is a pen. The one they had on display, they had several on display, but the one they had on display that I saw the price for was 550 uh, British pounds. That's what they wanted for that pen. Do you know if I bought that pen, you know how many prize-winning, best-selling books I could write with a pen that good? You know? None, because I can't write it now with a cheap pen. You know, so, so changing the pen is not going to make the writing any better. It may make the experience better. You know, it may make you feel nice, you know, like you're somebody using this expensive pen. Uh, I don't know. These, this is a pen that I was given, and this is a pen that I was given as a wonderful gift this morning. But despite being given a wonderful pen this morning, and a pen that I, I like this pen, I can't write any better with these pens than the moment I walked in and didn't have the pens. It's not dependent upon the pen. It's dependent upon the person pushing the pen. Okay? Be careful of gadgetitis. In the Adventist church, it's, it's rampant. You'll get things like, well, there's a Canon Mark 6 D. And that's like the greatest camera ever. I love my Canon Mark 6 D. You know, it took me a year to convince the treasurer to buy this, buy this camera. And now I've got it. It's so cool. And then he finds on the internet, there's a Canon Mark 7. It's like, well, I need the Mark 7. How can I do my job? I don't have a Mark 7. I need a Mark 7. 
Now, the, the moment before, the Mark 6 was his favorite thing ever, but now he finds out there's a Mark 7 and he feels deprived, okay? Nothing has changed. That Mark 6 is just what it was before. It didn't change just because he read the article, it became a worse camera. It's just his perception of things. You say, I have to have the best of this, have to have the best of that. If God will give me that, great, but don't chase gadgets because there's always a new one coming out. Don't chase gadgets. There are a lot of photographers out there using primitive cameras. You know, most photographers, professional photographers, run their camera in manual mode. They don't do the automatic stuff because they want full control. And if you have a camera in manual mode, it doesn't need to be electronic or anything else. Because you're going to troll every part of taking the picture, then you don't need a fancy camera. You know, there's still photographers that, that uh, they use film. You know, couldn't sell a film camera today, particularly in the Adventist church. They don't, don't even make the film, for that matter. So be careful of gadgetitis. Remember that you have control of the camera, and the picture is only as good as you are. So photography is a skill, like everything else, so to be good at it, you have to do it a lot. You usually tell who, who's going to grow up to be a photographer because they're taking pictures all the time, because that's how they get good enough. They like the experience of taking pictures. They're, very, they're creative, and they like it, and they take a lot of pictures, and over time, they get better and better. What we're going to talk about today is going to be the, the basic things on working the camera. I think after you understand these basic things, you will be master of the camera, and you'll understand what a good picture is, what a good picture isn't, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll jump 10 years of experience by, under, by getting a good basic background of photography, things that would take you a long time to learn. We're going to do them pretty quick today. So my suggestion is, is to listen to me, not because I'm the greatest expert on photography, or not by any means, but these are a lot of things that we're going to talk about, some suggestions. It took me a long time to figure out or to discover when reading something else that I wish somebody just told me from the beginning. There are certain things you can do to make your pictures look really good that I don't know why they don't stress it in, photo in photography. Because the people that are making a living at it, they know these things. Why? But they don't share. I mean, they do share, but, but for whatever reason, uh, studying photography doesn't necessarily get to the result of taking pictures. So let's look at, let's look at a couple of things with, uh, with a uh, camera. I don't know why we call it DSLR. In the beginning, there was a reason to say this is a digital SLR, but there's almost no film anymore. So I think we can drop the D part, except the industry keeps calling it a digital SLR or a DSLR. SLR, by the way, means single lens reflex. DSLR. SLR stands for single lens reflex. Basically means you're looking in here to see out of there. Reflex had to do with the mirror. There, was, there used to be mirrors in here. In fact, that camera still, still has, the Nikon still has it. But there used to be mirrors in here. Now that's, this, one's a, this one is mirrorless. So when you take the lens off, there's no, there's no mirror in here. Most cameras, like if you took off the Nikon, it'll be a little mirror. That mirror goes up to get out of the way of taking the picture. This one doesn't have that. The picture you're seeing through here is a monitor. It's not the actual image, but it's, I, it's a, like a little TV camera that takes a picture looking down the lens, if that makes any sense. But it's a DSLR, digital single lens reflex. There are other cameras. This one gets you farther down the road. Uh, there are less, there are other cameras of other styles that are very competent. You know, that it's a good basic thing to use, but I'm going to use this because this is, uh, it's not only a good suggestion, but it's a good, uh, all right, I will, I will try to continue holding this. We'll go through the camera. So it's digital SLR, so it has a big lens on the front. It has this shape, that's how you know what it is. That's the SLR shape, that's a SLR with a mirror in it, but they're both SLRs. The modern ones like this one, probably just about everyone made now, records both video and, and stills. The other advantage, you don't have to carry two cameras. There's a basically a ratio, a general rule that you can put on, on cameras 
is that the bigger the lens, the better the picture, because it has to do with physics. A bigger lens will take a, bigger, a better picture than a smaller lens. Because a small lens, the glass has to be absolutely perfect, and you have physics involved that, don't, that you just can't overcome in the way that a lens works. The more light you can get into the camera, the better everything's going to be. So a bigger lens puts more light into the camera. Okay. There are also things like telephoto lenses, which are physically bigger for a different reason. But if you see a camera with a lens of this size, or they can go larger, like that one, figure it, it's called light gathering. It can see more light, and therefore it'll take a better picture. Does that make sense? Okay. By making a better picture, remember I mean it's capable of taking a better picture. It still depends upon the brain of the person that's taking the picture. Okay? So at least you can take pictures if you know what you're doing in low light versus a smaller camera, you can't take as good a picture in low light because the lens is, too, is really small. It doesn't see very much. There's a thing called sensor size. How big the sensor is. The sensor is what's recording the, the image. And they come in different sizes. And they, by the size, they record them as uh, megapixels, how many millions of pixels that they have. You can see this camera he's holding is physically larger than this one. It's a good indicator it has a bigger sensor size. The advantage of a bigger sensor size is that it can see in the dark. And it does something better called depth of field. This one's a smaller one, which has, still records excellent pictures in, in the dark. But uh, the sensor is smaller. So one thing you want to consider with the cameras is how big the sensor is. Generally, the smaller ones will work just fine for what you're doing. And the bigger ones are for like people that shoot video uh, or take photos professionally that can afford a camera that costs five, six, seven thousand dollars without a lens on it. This one works just fine. I can use any, pretty much any camera I want. Uh, I have access to some really, really nice cameras that I don't use. I let other people use them. Because one, this takes really excellent pictures. It has a good reputation for taking, ex uh, especially video. It has a good reputation. It's also small. And some of the other cameras are quite a bit bigger than this one. And I don't like carrying them around. When you're going through the airports, when you're trying to get through customs, you don't want big cameras. Uh, and this one works really well. Like, I'm really happy with this, uh, with using um, this particular camera, Nikon GH4. They don't make it anymore, but now they make the GH5, which is a little better, and unfortunately quite a, a bit more expensive. I think the GH5 right now is going about $1,600, $1,800, uh, which is you know, a fair amount of change. But uh, you know, a high-end camera, again, will start around 5000 Central size is important, but not that important, because what you're going to be doing is not uh, as important as it would be if you're a wedding photographer or something like that who's making a living out of it. And another thing, uh, talking about megapixels, uh, the camera manufacturers like to sell cameras citing megapixels. This one has 10 megapixels. This one has 43 megapixels. Which one is better? Uh, yeah, it's kind of it's hard to say which one's better. First thing you have to do is how are you using it? Because you know, if you take 43 megapixel picture, I hope you have a, hard, a big hard drive. So those pictures are really big. The, really, the difference it comes out to is when you're printing the picture, which almost nobody prints pictures, unless you're a professional. Uh, when printing the picture, the bigger, the higher the megapixel, the better, because it, can, it will look better on a bigger piece of paper. If you have fewer megapixels, then you have to kind of make it bigger. And of course, that, then it doesn't look as good when it's made bigger. That's the main difference. But you can also use megapixels to determine how modern the camera is, because every year they get more megapixels. So if you're doing 10 and they're up to 43 right now, you probably got a camera that's pretty old. But don't buy a camera just because of the megapixel, even though that's how the manufacturers market them. It, there's a lot, more, a lot more to it than just megapixels. OK, we're going to go through how the camera takes the picture and camera adjustments. This is all very technical, but you have to understand this to get the creative part out of your brain and through the camera to make it the image that you want. Okay, first thing is, is exposure. Who knows what exposure is? Exposure is basically how much light was recorded. 
or how much light was seen. That's the exposure. If you have too much light, the picture is too bright, and a lot of detail is missing. If you have a, too low of an exposure, you didn't have enough light, and it's too dark. So overexposure and underexposure. I think we've all seen, especially with film cameras, I think we've all seen the examples of overexposure and underexposure. When you do a picture, when you take a picture, the first thing you want to think about is exposure. How's the camera set up? We'll talk about the setups for exposure. But how's the camera set up? The first thing you want to do is exposure. When I take a picture, am I going to get what I think I'm going to get as far as light and dark? Am I going to go back and, well, now you can just see the picture immediately. But you know, when I take the picture, is it going to be all black or is it going to be all white? Or am I going to get the right, the right amount of light to the sensor? There's another thing called a, a histogram we're going to talk about for a moment on SLRs. This helps with exposure. Who knows what a histogram is? Usually very few. Let me see if I can call one up real quick. OK, we'll ignore the color wheel for a moment. At the bottom is a histogram. Histogram records or shows you a, a display of what the picture looks like, not what, it, what the image looks like or what the picture looks like to the camera, the way the camera sees the picture. So it shows it to you in this form, as you can see along the bottom. And mo most cameras come with this feature, because it's, it's kind of important, although most people, I don't think, have any idea what it does. But this, this will show up on the camera in the display somewhere. At this end is black. At this end is white. And it'll show you how much of white is in the picture. So if you take a picture, and everything is here, and then, picture, and then it ends like here, your picture's too dark. On the other hand, if it's up here, and all the picture is here, and it ends over here, it means it's too bright. So what you do on the camera is you adjust this. Camera will do it for you automatically, but if you're running the camera manually, and there are times where you'll, where you'll have to, you want it spread out across the whole thing with most, most of being in the middle. So the ultimate histogram looks like this, like a bell curve. Remember, you know, remember what bell curve is from school? Curve that looks like a bell. Higher in the middle, lower at the ends. Sometimes, let me explain how your eye works. Your eye can be fooled. Your eye has, is connected to a very sophisticated image processor called your brain. And your brain does a lot of work to take what your eyes see and make it into something usable for you. So your, your eyes will lie to you uh, because your brain is making it work for you to survive or you to function. When you're taking a, a picture or photograph, the camera is absolute because the camera doesn't know what your brain is thinking. So the camera's just going to do absolutely what you tell it. I'm sure you've been, uh, for exposure, I'm sure you've been in a dark room at some point in your life and you walk outside and you can't see anything. Everything is white and you shut your eyes and you just stop. You know that if you stand there for a few seconds, your eyes will adjust and then you'll be able to see just fine. Even though just a moment ago it was way too much light, give it a minute or two and it'll be, it'll be just right. That's an exposure issue. Your brain didn't know you're about to walk outside, so it didn't know to adjust your eye you know, until it happened. The same thing, you can go into a room when you sleep at night and turn off all the lights. It's so dark you can't see anything. But give it a minute or two and you can see things in the dark because your, your eye has adjusted, your brain has corrected things corrected it. <clears throat> the histogram, what it does for you in looking through the, the camera is sometimes your eye will lie to you and you'll think the picture is good when it's not good. Because you'll look at it through the viewfinder and say, oh, that looks, looks right to my eye, but your, your brain is making it look right to your eye. It actually doesn't look very good at all. But the histogram is like an absolute resource that tells you what the picture is. There's a, there's a lot about histograms, but basically what you want it to look like is a, is a bell curve where it's higher in the middle. Most of your pictures will be like that. If you take pictures of a, of a uh, like landscape, that's pretty much when you, you'll see a more perfect bell curve. If you take pictures of, of, of the city at night, you'll still have a bell curve, but you'll see a lot of black and you'll see a lot of white. 
but you'll see things in between. That's how you know it, it looks right. Is this making any sense at all? Yeah. Well, we're going to go back to it a couple of times. So just remember, when you operate a camera, I wish we all had cameras so we could see the histogram and play with it. Uh, exposure compensation. Now that you need exposure and you have a way to measure exposure, how do you control the exposure? Well, there's several methods. One is called using the aperture. Somebody know what an aperture is? Aperture is, aperture is a hole. In this case, it's a hole that we see something through. Let me grab a, a lens here, and I'll, oh, I think I have a picture. Okay, this, this is showing aperture. When I look through the, when I look through the lens, can you see the hole? Okay, that's the front side. That's how, whole the, how, whole, how, how big the hole actually is. And this is the other side, this is the lens side. That's how big the lens made the hole, visually speaking. It's expanded the light to that amount. If I can grab a, another lens here, we'll see if it, see if it ends more dramatically. This we'll talk about in just a moment. This is, this is the hole that's being made and how the hole is, is uh, is measured. I'm going to put the mic down for a moment. Okay, this is a lens I can use on the camera. This is a particular kind of lens. Doesn't matter if you remember this or not. This is a cinema tra cin cinema graphic lens. This is the lens that's actually made for making films versus that lens which is used for making stills or, or you know, videos or stuff. This is a, f a lens that was created to make films with. But the, this is good to demonstrate with because I can sh show the aperture. Should, you should, let me show it this way first. You, can everyone see the hole? It's a very small hole. Even on the back side, you can see it's still a pretty small hole. And then I can open the aperture. There's like there's little pieces of metal here that are opening and closing, like the petals of a flower. Actually, it's, why it's called an iris because it works like your lens of your eye. You can see this is. See, it's very large. In fact, it covers the entire uh, focusing area of the lens. So there's little, little pieces in there, that, metal pieces, that are shown on this graphic. These metal pieces slide across each other, and when they do, it makes the hole bigger or smaller. You kind of in your mind's eye see how these would slide to create this? That kind of makes sense. The more of these, the better. This one's just showing a very few because it's an example. Uh, but the more of these, the better. The perfect one would be round, like the second lens I showed you, where it looks round as you open and close it. But these are, these are apertures. Which, which one lets in the most light? Yeah, that one does. We saw that before. That lets in the most light, so when things are darker, when there's less light, the camera's going to move in that direction for more aperture. When it's outside in the sun, it's going to go for a smaller aperture. Okay? Now, what's confusing is that small apertures have big numbers, and big apertures have small numbers. Okay? It's, 
It's confusing at first. So you just learn it. That on the camera lens where it says, in this case, F14, that means F stop is 1.4. That's really wide open. In this case, F16, that's considerably, considerably shut down. This is hugely important to understand this because I'm about to show you how to take pictures to impress your friends. People are going to think you're the best photographer ever once you understand how to work this because other than professional uh, photographers, almost nobody ever understands this and knows how to work it. If you want to know why it's called a, what the measurements are from, you don't have to remember this, but it's just interesting because people don't seem to know this. <clears throat> Just, can everybody see the drawing? This is, this is the sensor that's taking the picture, that's seeing the picture. This is light that's coming through the lens. The light reaches a focal point, then expands back out. So the picture is actually upside down and backwards in here. This is the aperture. This, this would be sitting about right there. That's opening and closing. The f-stop number, in this case 1.4, it's how many times that circle fits in this space. This is actually turned that way. But if it were turned this way, how many times that fits in this space? And for this case, it's 1.4 times. If it's very smaller, you could put you know, 16 little circles here to do the space. Why they decided to measure it that way, I have no idea, but at least creates a way that you can measure how big the aperture is, you know, and use a number to do it. Does all this make sense? Because we're, we're about to talk about depth of field. I wasn't uh, going to wasn't going to use these, and I decided maybe maybe I should. Okay, here's here's the deal with depth of field. Depth of field is how much of the picture is in focus. Okay, in this case, it's a nice picture that looks like the Venetian in Las Vegas, which is a copy of Venice. And I know this is the Venetian because this is, a, this is modern. Anyways, that's what it is. It's what they call this, a colonnade. I think it's what they call this. Anyways, you can see from the back to the front, just about everything is in focus. So even though that was taken at night, I know that the aperture was shut down really tight. F-16, maybe even F-22. It was really tightly shut down. They just exposed, I'll get to the next thing about exposure, and that's, that's uh, shutter speed. But they, that picture probably took, you know, a half a second or so to make. You can see some blurring on the people that were moving. But that's, that's called deep depth of field. Everything's in focus. Now, a very interesting thing happens when you adjust the iris to depth of field. When the iris is wide open, you get this effect. This is shallow depth of field. Only very little is in focus. In this case, between focus and no focus on this flower is probably about two inches. So I took it before where it was probably 100 feet. And now the areas in focus is only about, you know, two inches, you know, six, you know, yeah, six, you know, five, six centimeters because the aperture is, is open. You know, what, what happens is this, all this is important to understand because when you can take pictures like that where you're controlling the depth of field, people think you're like the greatest photographer ever. That picture took me very little time to take. Actually, I wanted a picture of the bee, but uh, I took a picture of the bee and I liked it better shooting it this way. Then people think, wow, you're the greatest photographer. You're so creative. It's like, no, I know how depth of field works. When in the world of light, 
you have photons going in all different directions. So if you look in different parts of the room, you can see things are lit up you know, differently because photons coming from that direction, from the sun and bouncing off something to come in the windows, uh, is different. When you have an aperture that's, that's wide open, photons that are coming into the lens, not all of them are going straight. Some are going at an angle. You know, there's just a lot of opportunity for light to come in from different directions. And that creates a shallow depth of field because only, some, only a very few of the photons that are, that are coming from that one flower, straight from that flower into the camera lens, are focusable. But what happens when you, when you cut it down? It's that only the light beams that are going that way in a more direct manner hit the sensor. So that case, they're all focusable, as we saw in the other picture of the colonnade. They're, they're all focusable because they're, because they're all going in the same direction. Any photon that wanted to come in sideways won't. It'll hit the, it'll hit the, uh, uh, the shutter blades, the iris, and it will you know, bounce off, won't go to the sensor. Is that clear as mud? Is that understandable? So when you get a smaller number, you have a smaller amount of depth of field. When you go to the bigger numbers, you have a bigger amount of depth of field. Once you understand that, that you can control the picture through depth of field, your life is much easier. Sorry, on my screen here, the pictures are like this big. Even with my new glasses, I can't see them. Uh, who knows who this is? This is Cliff Goldstein. He edits your Sabbath School Quarterly. Uh, I was down in D.C. one day, and we just ran into each other, uh, walking around. So we are having a talk and everything. I took the picture. Of course, I wanted to see a picture of him. I wanted him in focus. I didn't necessarily want the background in focus, but I wanted it to be in focus enough so you could tell that it was a city. I can defocus this to a point where it's just gray with blobs in it. But by controlling the depth of field, I got all of him in focus, and the background, and the background is in soft focus. Can you see it? You actually, if, hopefully you can see it there. You can see the depth of field getting softer as things go backwards. This is in almost the same line as him, so this is almost in, in focus. So what I can do is I can control what you look at, what any photographer can, what, what professional photographers do for a living, is they tell you what to look at. And what the, how they tell you to do that is by controlling the depth of field. So in that picture, what do you look at? What is your, when you first look at it, what do you look at? You look at everything. You just, you're looking at the whole picture because everything's in focus. In this case, the photographer wants you to do that because the pattern is, is, uh, is repetitious. So that's what he wants you to see. Uh, where was I? In the case of the flower, now what do you look at? When you first look at the picture, what do you look at? I can tell you, I don't even have to ask. First thing you looked at was this. Your eye went right there where my finger is. Because that's in focus and it's a different color than everything else. You also use color to control what people look at. But when you take a picture, if you think about the depth of field, like I'm taking a picture and there's 5,000 people standing behind them, I don't want pictures of 5,000 people. I want a picture of one person. So what I will do is I will open the iris so that that person is in focus and nobody else is. So you only look at him. You can see there's people in the background, but you only look at that person. Does that make sense? That's very important when you're doing field photography is to have the camera opened up a bit so you're only taking a picture of things that, that you want to see. You take a picture of a person in, in front of, uh, I don't know, it's a news picture, and it's a person in front of a riot. If you, want, if you want the person to be the subject of the picture, you better do something about the riot because people want to look at the riot and not the face. 
So you have to get rid of it. And if you can't change positions, then you control it with depth of field. All right, on most cameras, on SLR type camera, depth of field, the iris is very simple to change. The next thing we're going to talk about is uh, ISO. Who knows what ISO is? It's an acronym for something. International St Optic Standard, Standard Optic, I don't, I don't really remember. Uh, basically what ISO means is how sensitive the sensor is to light. You can make the sensor so it's not very sensitive to light. You can make it to where it's very sensitive to light. So when you're taking dark pictures, you want it more sensitive. When you're taking bright pictures outdoors, you want it less sensitive. That's controlled with the ISO. ISO is important to understand because just about any camera, you can dial up and change the ISO, and it moves the controls of the cameras in various directions. So the more light, say I put ISO you know, 1000, which is for dark pictures, the, ca the sensor will be more sensitive, which means I can stop down the shutter more if I want less things in focus. It allows me to do that. Clear as mud. It's all, all you really need to know is makes the camera more sensitive or not. Okay, who knows what focus is? If you've ever put a camera in your hand, ever, ever, you probably thought about focus first when you took a picture. Obviously, the, the, the picture needs to be focused. It means the things have to be seeable. Your eye, what's confusing if you're not a photographer, is your eye does focus automatically. You don't think about focus. In fact, you don't think about anything but your eye, except where to look. But your, your eye does your focus automatically, and your brain knows what to, what to look at. When you look around the room, it's kind of dark in here. When I look around the room, I see everything in focus. But I know when I'm looking at the front desk here that the back row is not in focus. But when I look at the back row, it's in focus because my brain has already figured that's what I want to look at, and it's corrected the problem. The lens does the focus. It's built into the, into the lens. Same as your eye. Your eye has a lens, and that's what controls the focus through, through a muscle. The, uh, ir the iris of the camera, I'm sorry, the uh, lens of the uh, camera, you have to do yourself, of course. And what it does is, is it just moves the pieces of glass back and forth to change the focal point. You know, if you've ever used a magnifying glass and put it on the sidewalk and you try and get the sun focused, you focus the sun, you know, you can burn paper or whatever by using a magnifying glass. You also know from using a magnifying glass that if you wanted to read something, you have to run the glass back and forth or up and down with your eye because you're changing the lens in your eye versus the lens of the magnifying glass. So focus is extremely important. It's fundamentally important to taking a picture because through programs now like Photoshop and the like, there's a lot of bad pictures that can be fixed by computer generating you know, a better looking image by adjusting it in the computer. But focus cannot be fixed. If you have a camera that's out of focus, you have a picture that's out of focus, it's forever out of focus. You can't focus something that's not focused. So if you do anything in the picture, you should think exposure first, but if you do anything in the picture, make sure it's focused. Because if it's not, it's not, and it's not, use and it's not usable. You have different types of focus. You go through this. All, all cameras of some do this in some manner or another. For focus, you have manual focus. Obviously, you adjust the lens with your hand and focus. And you have autofocus, where the camera focuses for you. If you're in a hurry, it's best to autofocus. If you're not in a hurry, it's best to focus manually. And most modern cameras have something called a focus aid that will show you in the picture when it's in focus. Because sometimes it's hard to tell on the little screen if it's in focus or not. <clears throat> if you're, but if you're in a hurry, if you're doing like journalism pictures and you're running from one place to, to the next quickly, you probably want it to be an automatic. Otherwise, you want to keep control over it. Because sometimes the camera makes bad decisions. I, want, I have two people in my picture. I want one focused and one not. Sometimes the camera will decide to focus on the other one. Not really sure what you wanted, so it did what it wanted and it focused on the other person. Or focused on the background instead of the person. So you got a nice, clear background, but the person in front of you is not in focus. So it's best to run 
a manual focus, except when you just have to take pic a lot of pictures quickly. In the um, auto, you have something called uh, single focus. It means you push the button, usually halfway down, the camera will, will focus the lens, and that's that. If your subject moves and, or whatever, then they're out of focus, or potentially out of focus. You have something called tracking focus, which the computer and the camera uh, is told to follow the, the object. So when you push the button halfway down to focus the camera, as the person moves, they will stay in focus. The lens will start adjusting to keep that item, whatever you've told it to focus on, in focus. That's great for sports, particularly like football, where people are running all over the field. You see these people with these really long lenses and how they take pictures, they can follow focus. So as the guy's running across the field, the camera stays in focus. One other, th one other thing we need, need to, uh, to talk about very briefly is shutter, because that's the other way exposure is, is controlled. For most, for most cameras, unless it's mirrorless like this one, the, sh the, the sensor is only getting light when you tell it you want light. So if it's like a mirror camera like this Nikon, the mirror goes up, the camera opens up, it takes a picture, camera closes down, the mirror comes back. So on a, uh, that type of SLR, we take a still picture. The exact moment you take the picture, you can't see what you just took a picture of, because the mirror just went up. It goes very fast, but nonetheless, the mirror went up. So you don't see uh, the exact image. A mirrorless, you will see the image uh, at all times. But when you have a, a shutter on the camera, the shutter um, will open and close at different speeds, like a 20th of a second if it's like dark, or a thousandth of a second if it's, if it's bright. That's one of, one of two ways that exposure, one of three ways that exposure is controlled by how long the shutter is open, how much light is allowed to come to the shutter. The other way, remember, is ISO and, and aperture. When it comes to automatic exposures on cameras, basically, if you have a mirrored camera, and I think in the next few years, they'll probably go away. If you have a mirrored camera, you want to remember shutter because it, it controls motion blur. So if, like if you're outdoors taking pictures um, and it's very bright, you can have a very fast shutter and then there's very little motion blur. Motion blur is what, when an object moves, when the picture is being taken, they can be blurry. Even though they're focused, they'll blur because they're, they're in motion. With a very uh, slow shutter, obviously it's open longer and the person can move farther. With a very fast one, the person moves you know, hardly at all and uh, they'll, they'll stay in focus. The main point of that is, is motion control. And on a very, if you want a particular iris setting, aperture setting, like at night, uh, you want to shoot at f16 like that colonnade was done. If you want to shoot at f16 uh, in the dark like that, you're going to have to change the shutter speed and the ISO uh, and or the ISO to make sure that enough light's going to get on the picture. But like I I don't know if you could see it from where you were, but I pointed to the woman who was a little bit blurry because she moved during the time the picture was taken. In sports, you want it really fast because these guys are like kicking and running fast and you, and you want them to look good. You don't want to be smeared across the picture. So you use very fast, very fast shutter. Is all this making sense? This is like engineering class. <laughs> but, but you really have to understand this because once you understand this well, the quality of your pictures goes up phenomenally because you know what you're doing. This is, knowing this is called knowing what you're doing with a camera. This is what most people don't know what they're doing with a camera. That's why most people take really bad pictures because they don't know what they're doing. My wife uh, uses uh, the same cameras that I do other than her own phone, but when she takes it with a camera, she uses the same camera as I use because it's my camera usually and she takes really bad pictures. As much as she likes them, they're really bad pictures because she doesn't know what she's doing. And when I try to explain to her what she needs to know, what to do, she doesn't want to hear it. So she lives with her pictures and she says, I'm happy with it. So, okay, they're your picture then and I'm not my picture. So you really need to understand this to understand what, what photography is. And then when you start looking at pictures, you're going to understand what the picture is about. And when you understand what the picture is about and you start looking at other pictures, in your mind, you're going to start figuring out what good pictures are, what they look like, 
and how the picture was taken. Because before you take a picture, before you take a picture, the picture has already been, the picture has been created before you took the picture. The picture was created in your mind. You have a mind's eye view of what the, what the picture should be, and then you're using the camera to recreate what you see in your mind. Is that clear? Yeah. Unless that picture exists in your mind first, you won't get it. Because it never, there was nothing to create. Because it didn't hear. You know, when, when the, uh, was it Michelangelo that painted the Sistine Chapel? You know what that picture looked like in Michelangelo's mind before he painted it? Exactly the way he painted it. Because <laughs> he had to imagine it here first. So when you take a picture, you have to imagine it here first and then use the camera to create what it is that you're seeing in your mind. Is that clear? Okay. So you have, you have, uh, yes ma'am. Okay. Can you go 345? Let me just explain this part. This is a natural break right here. Okay, let's talk about automatic exposures. Most modern cameras have automatic settings that you can control what's being done manually and what's being done automatically. You have shutter priority, which I just talked about. You set the camera, it's gonna take a picture at, I don't know, say 1 25th of a second, because that's the most important thing to you, is that it be 1 25th of a second, and then the camera will make all the other adjustments to make sure that picture comes out correct at that shutter speed. So it'll change the aperture to the correct size. You frequently will adjust the ISO to get uh, also in that equation to get the right picture. So that's really good for sports because you want to shoot really fast shutter speeds at sports. So you want to make sure the camera is on say a thousandth of a second or two thousand or four thousandth of a second. So the, so the motion is, is controlled and, and the pictures are very crisp. Uh, and if the player runs into a dark part of the, of the pitch, then the camera automatically adjusts for it. And you still have the same shutter speed because you're still running the same speed. Uh, so you want the same amount of, of uh, control because he's not going to change speed that he's running, even though we went into something dark. The camera's made all the adjustments to make sure you get the picture you want at that shutter speed. Aperture priority, and this is the more important one, you set the aperture of the camera and then it does everything it needs to do to make that aperture work. Aperture Priority is more important, unless you're doing sports, is more important because it controls depth of field. And depth of field can be seen very easily by the viewer, by the person looking at the picture, and they will actually judge your picture by how well you did depth of field. So I took that picture of the flower that people think is like this really cool picture. It took me, you know, I don't know, seconds to take the picture because I knew how to manipulate the depth of field. I put the camera on a very open setting and let the camera do all the other all the other functions, because the, the B that was our, I was originally after wasn't going to be there for very long. Okay, so my suggestion is when you get a camera, like a, a real camera with a lens that's not built into a phone, that most of the time that you set it for aperture priority, figure out what it, how much you want to in focus, and you're going to have to play with your camera, taking pictures with the camera to figure out how your camera works depth of field, because they're they're different according to what kind of camera they are. So that you learn, okay, I want to take a picture of this person, but I want the background blurred. I need to go, say, F4. Would give me the best result. You know, you need to know that uh, uh, if I want everything in focus, like that 40 feet, or no, it's more than that, it's well over 100 feet of that colonnade, I want everything in focus. Say, well, I have to stop down to like F16 to do that. Okay, because you have experience with the camera, you know what the camera can do. If you start at F4, take a picture of the colonnade, only the little piece in the middle is in focus, and you go, okay, hey, go to the next one, you know, go to uh, uh, <clears throat> the next logical one would be like 5.4. You take 5.4, no, it's too, it still need more, okay, then you go to 8, no, and you go to 11, no, and you go to 16, oh, finally got it. You know, life isn't long enough for those kinds of pictures, not journalism pictures, so you need to get an idea from the beginning what aperture I want, and then set that. Generally taking pictures of people, you want the aperture very narrow by using a, a very small number. And generally pictures that are, that are of groups, you want the aperture uh, 
smaller, so you want a bigger number, because you want more in focus. You don't want just the people in the middle in focus and the back row not in focus. <laughs> you, have to, you have to know that off the top. Otherwise, you're just taking candid photos that are taken, you know, the expression off the cuff. They're just, you know, you just pick it up and take a picture. Everybody takes pictures like that. And the, the Congress of the Union may not need to be paying somebody to take a picture everybody else takes. So at least, you know, make sure you're doing good pictures. Also, when it's published, depth of field is very important because it, it's one of the very few ways to control what the person looks at. Figures a black and white photo. Okay. Let me say one other thing and then we're going to break. And it has to do with, uh, with the whole concept of, of this type of photography. Your brain, most of us have two eyes. You have two eyes because you see in, in three dimensions. One eye sees a little bit of this way, and the other eye sees a little bit of that way, and your brain puts the two together and it configures thing, figure out distance that way. I know this camera is in front of the second row because my brain is telling me it's in front of the second row. Now, if I close one eye, it kind of looks like it's in the second row, but it's not. It's in the first, you know, it's between the two. Because with one eye, you can't see depth. Okay, your brain might figure out by size or some other way that it's in front. It already knows it's in front because it's seen it before. But, you know, if you were to look at something unusual, it looks flat and you can't tell how far apart it is. That's why it's very hard for some people when they lose an eye. For a while, it's very hard for them to drive because they don't have depth perception. So the camera, unfortunately, has to live in a 3D world, even though the picture is only two-dimensional. It only has a up and down and a left and right. It doesn't have the, the Z, the one that goes back and forth. So you have to fake it. And what depth of field does is it, it fakes it. It makes it, it makes the picture look three-dimensional when it's not three-dimensional. The flower, when you look at it, physically looks like it's in front. Well, we saw the flower picture. We'll, we can look at it again later. The flower physically looks like it's in front of everything else because it's the only thing in focus and your brain, which is used to three-dimensional pictures, thinks it's three-dimensional and it looks physically in front of it. It's not. It's, to, it's, in the, it's on a monitor screen. No, it's just the same place all the other stuff is. But your eye perceives that it's there. Your eye also, are on the subject of 3D, your eye perceives that the brighter things are in front of the darker things. So if you take a picture of a guy you know, in a, in a suit, and behind him, you know, some distance away is a guy in an all-white suit standing out in the sun. When you take the picture, everyone's going to look at the guy in the back with an all-white suit before they look at the person you want them to look at, because he's brighter than everybody else. So you look there first. So another thing to think of when taking a picture is the thing that I'm taking a picture of brighter than everything else, or is at least that it's not darker than everything else, because your eye will look at the brightest thing. The other one I mentioned, which when I pointed to, I can tell exactly where people look at the picture because there was a, not only was it in focus, but it was a, color, a different color. There's a color difference. Your brain wants to look at that first. Another, oh, the reason it's trying to check out what's going on. Why is that a different color there than everything else? And your eye will look there first. Okay, why do we... Uh, so uh, something on, on uh, Al Jazeera last night. Uh, I really needed to go to sleep, but this was like I'd never seen this before. It's the most amazing thing I think I'd ever seen. It has to do in, in the Congo. Maybe everyone else in the world is familiar with this but me. But uh, these has to do with generally men who are not quite well off financially, but they walk around in these really nice Armani or Versace suits that are very expensive. And they, they dress, I mean, like their appearance is perfect. And some of them wear like, you know, the, I mean, just absolutely immaculate, even though, you know, they have to work multiple jobs and everything else, just trying to make enough money to buy one suit. But for some reason, it's just something. I don't know. I really don't know what it is. But it's a, it's a cultural phenomenon there. Apparently, it's been going on for a long time. But some of them wear a lot of stuff. They wear like black and white checkered pants, a red striped shirt, you know, a neon purple tie, you know, and stuff like that. I mean, really outrageous colors and everything. But people, uh, when you somebody that's see somebody that's dressed like that, it's kind of uh, annoying to see it because your brain has so much, to function, so much to do in the picture 
because there's, there's too much to it. You know, it's like somebody wearing, you know, bold stripes with a tie that has thin stripes. It's like it's too much to look at. That's why normally you avoid that. There's too much to look at because your brain just has too much. It's just too much work. So what you want to do in your pictures, your color pictures, is knock the colors down. The flower picture works better because it's basically only two colors. I mean, it's, it's okay to obviously use full spectrum of colors. But uh, <clears throat> if you're taking pictures of, say, you know, some guy uh, who got baptized or whatever, and in the background there's a guy dressed as you know, one of these people with a checkered shirt and a striped tie and neon green pants or whatever, everyone's going to look at that other person and they're not going to look at the one you, you thought they should look at. Clear as can be. The simpler your photos are, the, the better pictures they are, and the more your friends and family and most importantly your employer we think you're a photographic genius. Ansel Adams' pictures were taken of Yosemite. Remember from the pictures, it's a very complicated place. But you notice how simple his pictures are. And it's the simplicity that makes them great pictures. Okay, is this clear? Yeah. Okay, it's like sitting in engineering class. <laughs> when I first went to college, I went to engineering school. And one day I was working on all these equations for the density of air at a certain air pressure. I mean, it's the density of air at a certain altitude. And it's like, gee, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. So that afternoon, I switched to journalism. So I went from like, my life's goal is to be an engineer to I'm going to be a journalist in like four hours. It was, a good it was a good way to go in the long run. It worked out, but it, at the time, it probably wasn't the best thing, decision to make. But this is, this is just playing with numbers. But I hope you can see that what you can get by understanding how this works, that your picture is going to be a lot better. And I think one thing, because we're all called by God to do our job, is to figure out how to do it the best way possible. Okay, some things God will just show you, and some things you have to learn. Hopefully today God is showing you and you're learning at the same time. Okay, so let's take a break. How long do we want this break to go, Salise? Ten minutes. Okay. But now that we understand how, how uh, light works, let's talk about lighting. Okay, there's, there's two reasons to do lighting. One is to make sure that there's enough photons to record a picture with, and the other one is to control how 3D the picture looks. One's called modeling. It's modeling the face or whatever you're taking a picture of, so it looks three-dimensional. And the other one is just because it's too dark. You know, when you see the flash on top of the camera, that's just because it's too dark. But if you go into a photo studio where they're taking pictures, you see there's multiple lights because they're trying to model the face and make it look three-dimensional. Okay, is it clear? Because light, lighting is usually more than just providing enough light. Sometimes in journalism, all you can do is a flash and that's what you use. But when you have other, other options, you take the other options. Okay, all, all, the standard of lighting is to light a person. Okay, so all, all lighting is three-point lighting. I mean, there's, there's three lights that are made to make the image. You write, may want to write this down. You have, you have what's called the backlight. The backlight is behind the person. And it provides what's called separation from the background. If you move the light to one side and up, her light's like right here. It simulates the sun. You get the modeling effect. You've got one side of the face brighter than the other. And all these little shadows are used to create depth and, and uh, much light is the key light, but enough that you could see detail in her hair that you can't see now, but not so much that it overwhelms the the key light. Now, you, could, you could spend a lot of time talking about lighting, but that's, that's the gist of it.